Welcome back to the Oscar Project Podcast, the show where I discuss Oscar-nominated films year by year. I am your host, Jonathan E. Treberg, and today I am recapping everything that happened at the 96th Academy Awards last night. To help me get through all the winners, performers, snubs, and speeches, I'm joined today by Luis Mendez from the Mendez Movie Report. Luis, thanks for joining me today. Thanks for having me. Um, it's a big weekend for us movie fans. The Oscar one season's finally over, and uh, for me personally, it's a big day because it's my uh, 35th birthday, so... It's, uh, oh, well, happy birthday. Yeah. It was my birthday yesterday, too, so we each got oh, a little yeah. birthday present so, this so weekend. So you notice that that's two straight years that uh, the Oscars have fallen on our birthday weekend, so... That's right. That's right. It's it's a good time of year. Good time of year. Well, let's get right into everything from last night. Uh, for me, the big story, obviously, was Oppenheimer with the big win, uh, taking home Best Picture and Best Director, took home two acting awards, I think seven overall. Uh, what's your reaction to Oppenheimer's big night last night? I mean, I, I'm very happy with the result. Uh, Oppenheimer was my personal number two movie of the year. I think it's sort of like, uh, uh, it's sort of a celebration, really. It's not just Oppenheimer, the film itself, but also Christopher Nolan. In the same way that Schindler's right. List was for Steven Spielberg, or Departed was for Martin Scorsese, or even like Shape of Water with uh, Guillermo del Toro. It's sort of like, a cele- the yeah. chance to celebrate this uh, tour uh, with a filmography and fan base um, and somebody that's able to hit through with the mainstream as well like a Nolan, uh, Nolan is it, it was really good that they had Spielberg of all people give him the award because he's sort of I, I have been telling right. a lot of my friends like you know this is sort of like our generation Steven Spielberg finally getting his Oscar yeah because Spielberg had a lot of those you know he had things like Mm -hmm. jaws and jurassic park but then you mentioned schindler's list so he was he was hitting both sides of the fence there with you know the the blockbusters and and then the stuff that's going to get that oscar recognition which i think nolan has done as well throughout his career obviously batman things like interstellar and then then this for oppenheimer and he had some uh dunkirk recognition a couple of years ago too so i think that's a very very appropriate and, and he's basically the reason we haven't expanded Best Picture lineup because of the whole controversy over Dark Knight right. missing that year. Um, and I think this is also, in a way, showing me that we may be entering a new era for the Oscars where, don't get me wrong, you know, I, I think my hot take is that I think a lot of the Best Picture winners from the 2010s are good movies, but you know, like you would have some that are quite frankly, probably going to get forgotten years down the line. Yeah. You'll have others that won't be forgotten, but they're not necessarily going to have that mainstream appeal, like a moonlight. Like th- those are the ones that we cinephiles are going to learn about and grow from and, right. and, and learning film schools about, but they're not going to be films that were necessarily going to be grow. People are going to be growing up with and showing to their kids. But I think that w- with everything everywhere last year and now Oppenheimer, we may be returning to sort of like what we saw in the 90s where there was this box office component with that best picture winner. And in a way, mm-hmm. we the new, younger, hipper academy is might be leading us into a little bit more of mainstream choices for uh, best picture. Yeah, no, I, I think that's absolutely right. I think it does. It's one of those things that kind of goes in waves. You know, you, you have that kind of thing back in the 90s and you know it's been a little bit more in, in another direction for the last uh, little bit but i think you're right i think we're we're heading that direction it'll be interesting to see where things go from here in the next couple of years the other thing i wanted to mention was uh poor things uh, obviously a big win for emma stone for her role in that film but uh, i don't i don't know the exact count but i know it won at least uh, three or four of the you know technical categories as well production design i think costumes um thought that was it was a little bit of a surprise to me that it won as many as it did in in some of those down the line categories i thought some of those would be split amongst poor things barbie killers of the flower moon but you know most of those ended up going to poor things which i think uh was interesting as well i mean i i wasn't too surprised i had predicted poor things to win the three crap categories that it did and then I ended up predicting that Lily would win, even though I I wasn't feeling so sure about it because I was yeah. predicting already Poor Things to do so well elsewhere. I I do believe Poor Things was probably number two in picture. Now, granted, I think it was probably a, a um, distant number two, 
but I, yeah. but I do think it was the number two in best yeah. picture. Um, I'm not surprised that it do, did do us well compared to Barbie, because one of the things that I've been pounding the table about all year long is that Barbie has good audience scores and Barbie has incredibly passionate fans. It, I think it's, it's the most watched on Letterboxd now. Like, it, there is no doubt about it that that movie has its massive fans. And that movie is going to go on to be a Gen Z classic. They're going to be yep. passing that on to their kids. So it's going to be a big mainstream hit. Um, that's going to go down as one of those cool Best Picture nominations. But I've been noticing that its audience scores are good, but not great. Um, I personally was not a fan of Barbie just because the comedy just wasn't my cup of tea. And, you know, comedy subjective. There's always going to be a bit yeah. of a ceiling with that. And I think that that was always going to cost Barbie. Um, I honestly don't think it was so much genre vibes because we saw everything everywhere overcome that last year. I think it just that poor things had much better audience scores from what I noticed. And I've always been a big believer. Look at the audience scores. It kind of goes back to my old days from when I used to write about polling. It's like, look at the data and what it tells you about what the, what the public thinks. And I always thought that Barbie was going to be weaker when we got to phase two, because the critics had higher scores for it than the audiences. And, I, and I'm aware that there are some bad faith people out there who do review bombing and stuff right. like that. But I don't think it was just that. I think, you know, when you're dealing with something as, as subjective as comedy, um, especially with how all out comedic Barbie was, you have to, there was a little bit of hard messaging at the end there, but you know, where everything everywhere got away with it because during the second half, that movie basically becomes a family drama. Whereas right. Barbie kind of keeps the silliness going almost throughout the whole thing. So I think that allowed something that was a little bit more experimental and out there, like poor things to uh, hit better with the industry. Um, so I wasn't too surprised. Um, but again, while I do think poor things was number two, I think it was a distant number two. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I think even in, in the, the uh, prediction uh, contest that I ran, uh, through my uh, newsletter, the uh, Oppenheimer was an easy number one, uh, even you know going through ranked voting the way that the Academy does the best picture. It was uh, by far the number one choice for the majority of people who responded to that, even among people who I don't think necessarily saw uh, even Oppenheimer, let alone most of the best picture uh, nominees. You know, they may have seen one or two, Barbie probably being one of those. Um, so absolutely agree it was it was probably a distant distant second place there well oppenheimer just hit a, so many boxes it's like yeah it, it was a box office hit uh going back to audience scores it had some of the best audience scores of the year i mean like it had audience scores that were up there with like what top gun maverick had uh the year before um it had uh and on top of that something that i think is a becoming a big and big thing for award season it was the cast everybody wanted to hang out with, which was a little right. bit surprising yeah. to me because usually the that's homies. the yeah <laughs> because usually it's, that's the underdog. Like when everything everywhere still had that underdog, right. it's the family, the Coda family. That's what usually pe- the the awards room what gravitates to to hang out with. But it was the Oppenheimer cast that they really gravitated to this season. Yeah. Um, want to talk a little bit about uh, Mr. Kimmel. Um, I thought his opening monologue went a little bit too long uh, for my taste, uh, but this is now his, I think, fourth uh, time hosting since the, uh, including the debacle back in 2017, was it, with uh, La La Land and Moonlight? Um, so I, I think overall he did pretty good job um uh, other than that opening monologue going a little bit too long got his uh his donald trump dig in there towards the end uh the obligatory donald trump dig um i thought some of the some of the bits were were good i thought some of the reaction to some of the wins were were clever i actually really liked his response when when emma stone one and he told her to rip up the envelope so there's no question about the best picture announcement coming up um so what what did you think of of jimmy kimmel overall well i I gotta be honest i think he came i think he delivered better last year but i I still think he did a pretty good job um he if i had to describe it him he basically he's the safe pick he's a safe pick he's he's gonna do the bits he's gonna do the jokes but he's he's generally gonna be 
you're not going to have some of the disasters that you've had. I mean, you should, you saw that with Joe Coy uh, at the Golden Globes. Yeah. Like, this really could go bad if you don't got someone in there that knows what they're doing. Um, so I, I, I thought he – I didn't think it was as good as he of a hosting duty as he did last year. But I do think that he generally did the job that he was there asked to do. Um, and and I and I I will say that I did think some of the bits were a, some of them I found more a little bit more funnier than last year. I mean, like I I prefer the John Cena skit that that to <laughs> cocaine bear bothering Malala yeah. like it was last year. I prefer that. So, but yeah, absolutely. Um, I did I I did like his opening monologue, even though I did I agree with you. I I think his opening monologue last year was better. But yeah, he he's 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 a safe choice, um, and I. I completely understand why the Academy keeps going back to him. Um, I do. I wouldn't be surprised if they try to do something different next year, but I also wouldn't be surprised yep. if they just stick with. Yeah. Him. Yeah. It's, I mean, it, it's one of those things that you, you almost have to have somebody who's used to that live hosting, uh, you know, like, you know, he's got his show. If, if the Oscars was something that kind of rotated around to different networks, like, you know, the Super Bowl or something like that, you might see, all the late night hosts taking a turn at it. And I think that would be, make a lot of sense. Um, but I, I think you're right. He's, he's a good safe pick. He delivers what he's supposed to deliver. And, um, you know, I, I, th I think I would prefer him to them to not having the host like they did a few years ago. I think that was, you yeah. know, I understand why they did it at the time, but I, I don't think it was something that was going to be long-term. They, they need someone there to, to steer the ship and, and get things going and, and check in on the audience every once in a while like he did. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, the whole non-host thing, I, I wasn't too big a fan of that. Um, though I will say yeah. that it did come, I, I did think it played off pretty well the year Parasite won. Um, but other than that, the, the no host thing, I, say, I was not a big fan of those, uh, that situation. I do think you need to, you need to have somebody there moderating and pushing the show along. Right. Yeah. And as I just thought of this too, I, I did like, um, uh, David Allen Greer do, doing the announcing and I like that he was in the back hallway talking to a couple of the folks, uh, I think either presenters or some of the, the, uh, you know, winners as they came off the, the stage, it was good to have at least, you know, that other voice and be able to see him. He wasn't just a voice in the clouds kind of thing, uh, announcing everybody that, that we actually got to see him and, and interact with him a little bit as well. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 uh, did, that's again, some of the things that I think they did a little bit better, uh, than last year. So these things that they do want to fine tune, I do think the kind of transition a little bit. I do think that I would, I'm a fan of having the past winners come, um, and, and, do the, uh, yeah. the, the, the the categories for the acting, but I did miss the clips. I'm a big clip right, guy, yeah. so yeah. I I think if they're gonna do that again next year, I would like them to do maybe like a thing where they they show the clips and then they introduce the presenters, something like that. Like just give us a yeah. little bit of a more clips so that we can see exactly these performances from these. Um, uh, nominees because remember there are people who are tuning into the oscars that they haven't necessarily caught up with all the movies and sometimes those clips right, yeah. can make them sort of want to check a film out or go check them out yeah yeah I, I almost wonder if they could do something where you know they they have a selection of previous winners in that category like they did but have them introduce the actor and the clip you know, in, in a video format. So they're not actually all there live. Obviously they want them there live. They want the, you know, they want to be able to say, Hey, we've got Ben Kingsley and Jennifer Lawrence and, you know, whoever else come in to, to be presenters. But if they could do something where they have them, you know, introduce as part of the clip, I think that would be a nice combination of those two. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, because again, I'm just a clips guy and I much yeah. prefer it. Yeah, me too. Um, but it, it was cool to see those past winners there. I, I, I am a fan of that part of the format. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. I, I really like that. It, when, when they came out for the, the first one for, for supporting actress, I was kind of like, oh, this is going to take forever. But once, once they got rolling into them, it, it did seem to flow pretty well. Though it did seem to make the winners a little confused when they got up there because it was almost like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you got five there, and you're and you're trying, and you're you get up there, you're probably right. nervous and just trying to get to the microphone to have your moment and get the yeah, speech yeah. done. But I did notice that Killian Murphy 
uh, specifically made sure to shake the hands of all five people. Uh, there were some yep. awkward moments other than that, particularly what happened yeah. with Robert Downey Jr. and Ki Hui Kwan. Uh, but, but I still think it's cool to see the previous yeah. winners there. Yeah, and and I think Killian Murphy, I, I'm pretty sure he was the only one who actually acknowledged the, them all. Uh, yeah, the ones yeah. that were up there he, on stage with sure him to shake, too. He made sure to shake all yeah. their hands. Yeah, and uh, you know it's again it's something new. So you know the 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 uh, winner, other winners may not have been prepared for something like that. But I, I think that was a really cool touch that they did. Mm-hmm. Um, you mentioned it earlier. Um, or I think it might have been before we got we got started recording uh, that. Uh, you know, the big snub was or not not really snub, but the one race that was coming down to the end was uh, Emma Stone and Lily Gladstone. Um, I was I was convinced it was going to be Gladstone uh, based on her win at the SAGs a couple of weeks ago. But um, obviously turned out going to Emma Stone a little bit of a surprise. Um, but again, back to your point earlier, poor things was winning a whole bunch that uh, last night. So it kind of seemed that it was going that way once we got to the the end of the night. Yeah, I mean, I I was I was so fifty fifty on this race. You you honestly probably could have gotten a different answer from me every hour. And then finally, when I had to nail it down, I went with the Gladstone because I was thinking that the momentum was on her side because there are statistical evidence that whoever goes last gets a boost. Um, but I think the more I've thought about it in hindsight, I think it just comes down to the fact that Poor Things was closer to Best Picture than Killers of the Flower Moon was. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's also a weird feeling for me because I personally would have voted for Emma, but it also would have been really cool to see Lily make history and do that speech. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's kind of feels weird where it's like, okay, well, Emma won and I'm happy for her. Uh, I personally found her to be have the best performance. But at the same time, it's kind of a bummer that we didn't get that historic moment with Lily. And yeah. unfortunately, because this seems to happen with a lot of uh, uh, actors of color, particularly women of color, we don't know when we're going to get to see her have that chance again. Now, hopefully, right. you know, she was in a Martin Scorsese movie, good good exposure. Uh, she could get on a roll and get, uh, be back on that Oscar stage. Um but I think at the end of the day, Poor Things was just more popular with the Academy. Yeah. Now, personally, uh, I, Poor Things and Killers of the Flower Moon were both in my personal top 10. But I did have Killers ranked higher than Poor Things overall as a movie. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah. I think there's the problem with Killers is that it falls into that problem that we see with one or two movies every year where we critics love it. And then we get to the industry stage and we get complaints uh, from people that well i respect this movie more than i like it and i think that that ended up happening with killers yeah agreed yeah and and i think i mean i I saw killers uh well before i saw poor things and i you know when i saw her in in killers i i thought she's gonna win this hands down and then once i saw poor things and i saw the the range of uh you know acting that emma had to do for that character you know just not not to say that Lily's was one note because it wasn't, but hers her character was dealing with you know one kind of major situation, whereas Emma's had to grow and experience an entire lifetime in the course of that movie, um, so to speak. So I, I think you're you're right that she had had the better chance there in the end. Um, the other uh, my other kind of not a snub because I knew it was going to win um, was uh, the wonderful story of Henry sugar winning for the best live action short. And purely sh- selfishly, I actually interviewed several of the other nominees in that category for the podcast. Um, and, and if you haven't uh, folks haven't listened to those interviews, I strongly urge them to go back and listen to those or the last couple episodes uh, before the Oscars. Um, so I was really hoping that one of those uh, other films would win the after invincible or red, white, and blue. I thought were all really good. Um, but I knew as soon as I saw Henry Sugar on Netflix back in September, October, whenever it was, I knew it was going to win as soon as I started watching it. Yeah, I'm, well, Wes, uh, um, you know, Wes Anderson finally gets a uh, yep. Oscar, and unfortunately, he's yeah, he's not, not even there to accept, accept it. it. Uh, yeah, um, I, I, you know, I, I, I loved for the most part Henry Sugar. Um, I am a Wes Anderson mm-hmm. fan, um, even though I, I don't think his latest stuff has been as good as yeah. his earlier stuff, but 
Um, so I'm happy for him, and I probably would have voted for it here too. That being said, I did go out on a limb and predict red, white, and blue, which if it weren't for Wes not yeah. being here, I would yeah. be my favorite, um, I, especially given the timeliness of it and how important um, uh, it is to, to uh, recent news events. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if it came in number two because I do think it was picking up some steam. But I think at the end of the day, and the thing is that with, a lot with these shorts is that if you read it in the anonymous ballots, a lot of these voters – don't even bother to vote yeah. for shorts. And, and when you have that kind of situation, either a surprise can happen, like we saw a, a, a bit of a mild surprise with a, a, a documentary, a short, um, or you end up with a situation where you just, they name yep. check. They, they, see they, someone like, they recognize they, and that's you know, the one they, see, they go with. Yep. They, it's either a director or, or th- that short happens to have a big yep. name actor in it. Um, so I'm not too, you know, I'm not surprised by it, but I, I did, that was the short that I tried to go out on a limb for and it bit me, but that's the thing with these shorts. When you get into Oscar prediction game, these, these shorts, the shorts always mess with you, whether it's nomination predictions or winning predictions. And, and I, I, I took, I went with the underdog, but the underdog came up short. West West was just too big a name. Yeah, and I think, to, you know, to your point too, the usually, oftentimes it's a big name director or, or a, a big star that's in those films, but he had both. He had the big name director. He yeah. had Benedict Cumberbatch, Ben King. You know, he had a bunch of big name actors in there. So it was just kind of everything uh, pushing that one. And the Netflix fact. Exactly. It was, it was yeah. much, very easy for them to have access to. Right. It. And I mean, the, the after was on Netflix too, but it didn't have its own little special collection like, uh, yeah. like uh, Wes Anderson had. Um, let's see. What else did I have in my notes? Um, favorite speeches. I had two favorites um, that I uh, picked out. I think the night started off extremely strong with Davine Joy Randolph's speech uh, for best supporting actress. I thought, and I've, I've, Several of her speeches that, you know, she's obviously won pretty much everything throughout the award season. And a number of her speeches have been very, very strong, very touching, very earnest and uh, humble, which uh, is, you know, not always the case with some of the actors, but uh, it, was, it was really nice to see. And obviously, this is the first thing that I've seen her in, or at least I know I've seen her in. So seeing her rise over this award season has been really good. It's nice to see her cap that off with the Oscar. Um, for for the holdovers, yeah, it, it, I have to say that it was nice for her to have to use the paper because I know there was a lot of complaints about her. She did not bring the paper this time. Um, I, I thought this was actually her best speech of the season. Uh, the 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 cutaway to Paul Giamatti having that tear in his eye. Uh, it, it it really started the night off on, on a good note. Yeah, and I also thought the other one that I, I noted down in my notes was um, the director from 20 Days of Mar- Mariupol uh, winning for Best Documentary Feature. Um, and I, my wife and I watched that film um, you know, in, in between, during the holidays last year and heart-wrenching film. And to his point, you know, he, he started off saying a speech, at, I, I wish I didn't have to make this film. Um, and I thought his acceptance was appropriately... Not not political because it wasn't really political, but appropriate to the situation and to the film. Um, and uh, again, that was another one I pretty much knew as soon as I watched it that that was going to win. Um, and I'm glad that it did because uh, I think it's an important important film for people to watch, as difficult as it might be. Yeah, I, um, uh, if I were an Academy voter, I would have voted for it as well. Though I do think it got help big time by the fact that. For yet another year, a big populist documentary got snubbed by the documentary branch, given the dominance of the Michael J. Fox yeah. documentary. And even to some extent, given how well it did with the Guilds, the American Symphony uh, documentary. Um, so uh, I, di- I I think it was helped by that. But I also ended, think that uh, you know it ended up being such a timely documentary, mm-hmm. especially given uh, Navalny's death. Right. Um, so uh, it all came together for it, but um, you know, I it's a great documentary. It's it's a it's a worthwhile documentary to watch. But I do wonder, like, what's it going to take for the Academy to do something about whatever this director's branch has been doing to some of these more populist uh, um, documentaries? I mean, like, 
I, 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 the only thing that I can think of is that they're scared that if they pick these movies that they're going to just easily win. Right. So they kind of go with the more Mix serious subject bit. matter. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I think the, the only time that I can remember them not denying the populist one was Summer Soul. That, that ended up just being a steamroller that yeah. even they couldn't deny. But other than that, um, the, yeah, we that's kind of led to this whole thing where a lot of these serious subject matter documentaries um, end up overtaking the big populist uh, contender that sweeps the critics. Right. Yeah, and, and, and I'm glad you bring up Navalny. I was very curious to see uh, you know him highlighted at the beginning of the in memoriam segment because you don't typically think of that as you know I I I wouldn't have made that connection to put him in there um, as as the beginning of the the in memoriam segment but I think again it it made sense to have him in there especially given that the the documentary featuring him won last year and obviously again uh, you know his his recent death made it very poignant for that to happen right now. Um, any other thoughts from you on the in memoriam as as a whole? I, I like I like the song that they picked. Um, I'm not a fan of the way that the camera work was done yeah, because agreed. I I don't think we really got a good look at what at and um I I went to, I saw the Oscars at the Tampa Theater here and they they had a big event mm-hmm. um and we got a big screen big crowd and during the in memoriam I, there were a lot of people who were kind of confused and trying to squint yeah. their eyes to see who was being featured on the screen, some delayed reactions. Um, I don't know what happened with that, but the next time that they would have set things up like that, they they really need to make sure that the camera is able to properly capture the screen, who's on the screen. Right. Um, but other than that, I like the song choice, um, and I thought it came off pretty respectful. Yeah, I thought, again, I agreed with the, the song choice. I liked having Andrea Bocelli there singing it live. Um, I'm, amazing performer amazing artist so always great to have someone like that there the the other part that i didn't necessarily like was the end when they just kind of threw a bunch of names up on the screen of like oh here's a whole bunch of people that we didn't have time to get to in the last three minutes so we're just going to throw them up there i think that's that's probably one area that they need to look at and how they address how they stage that uh in future years well i believe the problem with that is that the I could have swore that I read somewhere that there's a certain amount of uh, equal time that has to be given depending on the branches. Oh, okay. Um, and I think that's that's leading to cost these issues, yeah. especially in a year like this one where we lost a lot of uh, legendary actors right. in particular. So I, I think that it would be worthy for the Academy to look to take a look at that and see if that might be causing a couple issues there because that that. You, that, that whole thing where they're getting to the point now where they're like, oh, go online right, and, and yeah. read the rest of the names yeah. and stuff like that. Uh, you know, if Not they many people split are going to actually do that. Parts, yeah, yeah. I mean, like, do, if they got to split it up into two parts, you know, they, they're just going to have, a, they really got to look at that. And because I'm starting to think that that whole rule about equal time could actually be creating more problems yeah. than it solves. Yeah, agreed. Um. Favorite performance of the night. I initially thought it was going to be uh, the the singers for Wajaje, um, and then Ryan Gosling just stole the show. <laughs> I thought the the uh, love the love the song or hate the song, uh, indifferent to the song. I think the performance was phenomenal. Uh, I'm glad they got a bunch, you know, as many of the Kens as they could uh, from the movie, be they foreground characters or background. Um, I even saw a I think it was on uh, on Entertainment Tonight on Instagram had a video of all of the the backup dancers in the lobby afterward, all celebrating and enjoying themselves after the the successful performance. Yeah, and I didn't notice until later that it, they they were actually doing some uh, homage to uh, gentlemen prefer blondes. Oh, really? Uh, in the Marilyn Monroe scene, if you see the way that they had everyone, yeah, uh, suited I'll have to up go back and, and watch it. Yeah, you know, I. I wasn't, you know, I I was not feeling a lot of the song competition this year. I, it was the one category that was completely just not in tune with. Uh, my personal favorite original song from a movie this year was uh, "Steal the Show" from Elemental. Um, but 
I I will say, even as someone who wasn't crazy about Barbie, watching the uh, performance, and granted, at this time, I was really happy. I had seen uh, Godzilla win, which was my favorite win of the night, um, and and I was I had some spirits in me because they were <laughs> offering them at the Tampa Theater. But I tell you, the, the crowd ate up I that bet. Ken performance. Yeah. I think it I think it was easily the best performed of the night. Um, I think it would have been cool if I had one, uh, two, but you know, at the end of the day, they do tend to give these a ballads yep. and clearly the Academy adores Billie yeah. Eilish. Um, it, it's going to be interesting to see how many times she gets a song yeah. back in contention. Yeah. I mean, two and three years is that's interesting. Two and three years is very interesting. I mean, Lady Gaga has gotten some songs in there, but she's only won one. Billie Eilish is only, I think 22 years old. I was, I was seeing the other yeah. day. I mean, she's, super early in her career mm-hmm. and it seems like she's been around for a while but she's super early in her career she could be going at it for another you know 30 40 years knocking out songs every couple of years at the oscars so yeah, i think she'll be she'll be racking them up there before long um so we're running a little bit out of time but before we wrap things up um any bold predictions for the 97th academy awards uh films that we'll see next year uh guaranteed nominees anything like that that you you're looking forward to well two things first i think this is, has the possibility to be a more of a populist best picture slate uh, i don't think it's going to be as set in stone either the best picture race as it was this past season where mm-hmm. in hindsight after labor day we seem to already know the movies that yeah. were going to get nominated um i i i think that's because it the strike caused so many delays and when you look at the lineup that's coming yeah. uh this year um, it tends to be more popular. So I, I do not be surprised if you end up with a situation like a 2022 um, where, or even to some extent a 2018 where you get much more populous films uh, competing. In terms of a bold claim, I would say keep an eye on Coleman Domingo for Sing Sing. I've heard a lot of great things about that. He may, for all we know, just be our next best, best actor winner. Um, I mean, because Tiff... That movie had premiered at TIFF, and they were doing a big celebration of Coleman Domingo, and everyone thought, oh, it's for Rustin. But it turned out they were actually doing it for Sing Sing. Yeah. Um, and I do know that it is going to be A24's uh, top priority this year. Uh, that's coming out in the summer. I can't wait to check it out for myself. Definitely, yeah. And and not that it's a, a too much of a bold prediction, um, but uh, I have a, a feeling that we'll be seeing – Quite a bit of Dune 2 being announced. Um, for, uh, mm-hmm. Already, for me, feels like front runner for categories like visual effects, sound, production design, all of those those types yep. of things that um, I think the first one won several of those categories. I think it'll be returning to that as well. Well, I'd, I'd argue it's the super early front runner to win Best Picture. Now, I don't think it's going to. Yeah, I don't, I don't that, think so. But, either. I, it, it, the, but I do think it starts out as our front runner until we see what happens with the festival. Yep. Yeah, yeah, that'll that'll certainly and and I think you know being as early as it is will ultimately hurt it in the end. Um, you know, I, I we saw obviously didn't quite happen. Uh, they're having the other way around with everything everywhere last year. It was released I think in April last year or uh, so or two years ago rather. Um, so movies can outrun that um, with the right support, but I think uh, you know you're right. There's there's going to be a lot more coming down the road, especially towards the end of the year. Um, as we catch up from from having the strike. The other one that I uh, flagged in my notes, um, is, and I just saw the trailer for it last night, and I saw it the other day when I took the, my kids to see Kung Fu Panda 4, was the um, it's the Wild wild Robot, I think it was, um, animated feature. And I don't know too much about it, um, but it looks beautiful from the trailer. I'm really looking forward to, the, to seeing that when it comes out. Um, so that's my other super early... Uh, call for something getting a nomination next year no no i would uh, i i understand that but i will say that every year now we're starting to see these animated films lose steam the closer we get to the oscars yeah so I, it's yeah i i do wonder what's it finally gonna take for for something uh to really explode but uh yeah i, I the, that that's gonna be a very interesting one to keep an eye on yep well uh lewis 
Thank you so much for joining me today. Um, before we wrap things up, uh, let me know where, or let folks know where they can check out your work and where they can follow you on social media to keep up to date on what you're working on. Well, uh, just type in MendisMovieReport.com. It takes you straight to my Substack. Um, it's I do Oscar projections. I, I do some written movie reviews. Um, I post any thing that I'm involved in in terms of podcasts or, or links in my social media are there. Uh, I'm gonna be getting. I'm. I'm gonna be taking a little bit of a break, but after probably about uh, two weeks from now, I'll be back to writing movie reviews. And probably about a month from now, I'll already begin kind of starting to look at the next <laughs> Oscar season sure. because I just I'm already ready to start thinking about that. I, I love watching the race shift and change as we go along. Um, and in terms of my social media, uh, Facebook, Instagram, Threads, Twitter slash X. Um, Letterbox, Mendes Movie RPT, and that's where you can find me. Excellent. Well, I'll be sure to drop some links to all those so people can uh, check out your work. And uh, thank you so much again for jumping on to talk about the Oscars today. It's really been a pleasure, and hopefully we can uh, do this again sometime. I, I would love that. Excellent. <laughs>